to get the bats reacting to the walls as we kind of expect there's going to be a few different uh, kind of ground rules and expectations that i'm going to put into the logic just so that we know that we have full control over how the bat could potentially interact with the different parts of the level such as the floor the player different items interactables walls and so on so back inside of the enemy bat class inside of the event graph the first thing we want to do is the the way that we're going to kind of handle this is going to be from the collision events so as i've already mentioned the basic outline of this is when the bat hits something we want it to decide whether or not it should be turning around so we already have the main component that we'll need for this, which of course is going to be the capsule component. On the capsule component, we can scroll down and we can find the on component hit event and we can add this in. Now I'm just going to go through the way that I have this planned out. So you may want to have your enemy character interacting differently with the world. Generally though, there's a few kind of uh, rules when it comes to the way that I kind of look at game design on a more concept and theory based premise than just the real kind of mechanics behind it. So the first thing that always stands out to me the most is that one of the things that this enemy could potentially collide with will be the player class. And one thing I always find really weird when this happens is when the enemy hits the player and then has this automatic kind of logic triggered to make it turn around and move in the other direction. Especially when you break it down and think that the enemy is kind of really in the level just to either hunt down, find or interact with the player class in some way to provide damage. Especially as I'm kind of approaching this like a very old school Sonic or Mario game. Not some of the more recent ones where the enemies may pass through and have specific attack kind of montages uh, where they throw or punch the character as an example. These are the ones which are going to purely provide contact damage. So I tend to think it feels a little bit strange if the one thing the enemy is intended to do is to walk into the player and cause damage and then turns around. So what I'm going to do is the first thing we will drive from this is we'll pull from the other actor pin to find out what we've hit. And we only want to do our collision check if that isn't equal to the player pawn. So we don't need to do any casting or anything here. We can literally check whether the one thing, the only player in the game is going to be controlling. If the thing that we've hit isn't equal to that, so the other pawn or the player's pawn, we'll run a branch check from here. And if that's true, then we can go ahead and do our direction flipping logic. That's the first step done for this type of logic. The next thing is going to be finding, so if we have passed this one criteria that where we want to completely bail out and ignore any future logic, the next thing we can look at doing is checking the surface that we've hit or interactive against. And we can do that by dropping the hit pin just here. This provides a lot more information about the thing we've hit, such as the type of material it might have, its name, if it has a bone socket, the distance, and you can see all of the extra pins we've got here. Now, the one that we're going to be interested in is the normal, and this can give us an idea of the direction in which the hit was taken. So the next thing I wanted to account for is if something comes from above or below, so ceiling or a floor, or even another type of enemy or an interactive class, all of these things should also be ignored. So we can see how this looks if we drag from here and we'll do a print string. And inside of the print string, we can just plug in the hit normal is going to be the one that we want here. So let's just have a quick compile of this one and we can see what is going to be returned depending on where the bat is being hit. Okay, so if we're hitting a surface like this one straight on, we can see that we're getting a lot of hit returns from this single collision. Basically, for as long as this is colliding, kind of like a tick almost, we're going to be returning this hit function. Now, the important thing we can see here is that this is being hit on a positive one on the x-axis. So this isn't actually the hit position of the bat. Obviously, this is going to be minus one on the bat side at left, as we're already aware of. What we're actually getting is the positive location of the thing that we're hitting, which is at one on the x-axis of this wall. So flipping this around, I'm just going to pause this as soon as we hit uh, that little bit of a corner there. And in fact, what I'll do is go back in. Uh, we'll stop this because that's not going to be long enough. And we can increase this to something pretty high. So the first thing I want to show is the hit of this corner because that's not quite straight on, but it's not below. Uh, we can see... When we're getting these values like 0.25 and 0.9 or between 0.8, we can see that this gives us an idea. Uh, and also, no, sorry, that's minus 0.2 because this is coming from the left-hand side of this little hill just here. But it's also kind of on the corner, which is the top of the hill. So we've got a positive on the Z, mostly positive on the Z, giving us an idea that this is a corner and a uh, clipping the side just here as well. 
So in this case, what I would do is I'm going to kind of take these values and we can clamp certain ranges that we're going to ignore based on what's being returned. So if we let this go a little bit further, okay, so we can see a similar thing as we've hit this from, or we've been hit from above is the way that we want to look at this. We can see we're now getting a, a negative value on the Z because it's the bottom of the platform rather than the top of this hill. And again here on the X, we're getting a, a negative value because it's from the left-hand side of that platform. And we're gonna expect pretty much the same sort of thing from that brick and the wall. And this is how we can use our hit normal to get some information about the direction in which we've been hit from. So the first thing we want to do is rather than making our on component hit node much, much bigger by splitting the structure pin, because remember, we're only actually interested in one of these, which is going to be the X axis. So I'm just going to recombine this just to show you that if we keep doing this, it's going to get quite big. Another way around this is we can pull from here. And if you're not familiar, we can break this in a separate node. So they do the same thing. We can break this vector. It just means that we're going to have this in a slightly more separated location. We've already made this pretty long, so we can probably save a little bit of space by just separating this one out in a different node. Now from the X, I'm just going to be quite strict with this. So if this isn't equal to zero, so anything not zero on the X axis is going to be classed as a hit result that I want to respond to. So again, we're ignoring the Y and the Z, so floor and that kind of foreground, background collisions potentially will be ignored. And anything which is higher or lower than zero, because you could see we're returning point values. Uh, so even if it's just like clipping a corner, then I'm going to class that as a reason to turn around. So as an example here, if we were to hit that corner again, even though it was like point two or something, uh, we would still flip around and change directions. Now you could add in ranges. So if it's between uh, minus 0.4 or 0.4, then that could be the bottom of a hit result on the Z. And you may not want to uh, respond to that type of thing. That's completely up to you if you wanted to add that level of complexity in. Hopefully it's kind of making sense how we can use this though. But just to get the bulk of the logic in, we're going to keep this nice and simple for now. So what we want to do now, now that we've got this condition checking, we're going to set our moving right direction. And just an old trick here is we're going to get the current moving right direction and we'll set this to be whatever the current moving right condition is not. So we'll say move right equals to not move right. And we can use the not Boolean check here, pass that in, and it's essentially just inverting it. So this is going to say, if you're moving left, move right. If you're moving right, move left. Next, moving over, we're going to want to flip the direction of the bat, and we already have some logic above to do this. So of course, we don't want to copy this code. Instead, what we're going to do is we can grab this like we've done before, right click on any of these nodes and collapse it to a function. For the name of this, we're not technically changing the rotation. Rather than calling it change rotation or update rotation or something, I'm gonna name this one toggle facing direction. I just think that's the most accurate descriptor for what we're doing here. And then now we have this as a function, we can grab this in and we can plug this off of our function here. I already know that there's going to be some issues here because of the way that collisions are working. This here kind of gives you an idea of what might be happening because we get more than one of these function calls per collision essentially before we even have a chance to rotate. Because we're getting more of these returns per collision than we may want, we may get some clashing or flipping happening too quickly. So we can just check what's happening to begin. You can kind of see it there, it tried turning and then didn't quite, and then we've got some backward facing here. So it can look a little bit twitchy. So we want to make sure we have a little bit more control, especially on these kind of tight locations here, to make sure that we don't have too many updates happening at once. So to manage this, I'm going to use something called a do once node. As the name would indicate, this is going to only allow us to do something at that one time until we reset something. This is known as a flow control gate. So we're gonna pass this in here. We're gonna do this functionality just once after this. And I've put this in the wrong place. We want all of this to be after our do once. And we, so if this branch comes back as true, then we only want to toggle all of this once and change the direction once. Again, this is gonna cause a problem because this will not automatically reset itself. So if we hit something now, this is gonna be the longer way to check it, but we're gonna hit this wall. And then if we hit this corner, we should hope to see this flip or do something. But because we have that do once in place, it means we're only going to keep moving forward now and that functionality will never be checked again. So what we want to do next is once this has happened, we want to make a delay. We don't want this to reset immediately. Remember the part of the problem is that we're having too many hits colliding with the wall immediately until we kind of flip around. So we're going to add a delay node here. And the delay can be something very, very small. Something like 0.1 should be perfectly fine. 
And then when you see other people using this, a lot of the time they'll just throw in a reroot node over here or pass in the wire here and throw in a reroot node. Try and make this a little bit more readable. Uh, I'll show you a way that we can get around this in just a moment. It's quite a simple thing to do and just to keep the code more readable, but this will work. So we can now see that as we come in, uh, we're gonna hit this once, so we will have that called. And then we've got another problem that we can see here. So we're gonna fix all of these as we go through. But the main thing is that we're now flipping around again and that functionality is being called and checked more than once, as long as we've had that 0.1 second delay. And we should see it happening again when we hit something here. And that is all working perfect. Well, apart from the fact the bat is flying backwards, that is all working perfect. Okay, so before finalizing and fixing that last problem, one thing again, we're looking quite a lot in this series of videos at a kind of cleaner way to code, hopefully. So whilst we have some nice things nested into functions, everything here is very kind of blocked out to do its own thing. And one of the things you hear quite a lot as a detractor from blueprints is how you get spaghetti code and it can be hard to read and maintain your code base. And that is true. It definitely can be if nothing is put into a function, if everything is placed in the event graph, if you have looping wires here, which are going to make it much harder to work out what's calling what when you start adding different things here and different branches and sequences coming off of this and everything's looping around back into the do once at some point, it's going to get very hard to work out which direction your logic is flowing. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to remove this. That's not a great way to go ahead. We're going to create a custom event down here. So a nice, simple fix. And we'll call this one reset direction change check. So throwing reset into the naming convention probably helps just here. We know that this is going to be calling some kind of built-in reset functionality quite a lot of the time in Unreal. Uh, in this case, it's going to be this flow gate and the do once node. Then of course, from here, we're just going to pull from the delay and we'll be calling that reset direction change check. So nothing too wild there. Most of you probably jumped to that as the first kind of fix for that kind of looping functionality. And now it just reads much, much more clearly. The best thing as well here is that as you're reading through this, if you're starting to add code later, you're kind of fleshing the sites and expanding the logic, and this is getting a lot longer going into different functions. The main thing now is we don't have to check where this random wire is going from one part of your blueprint to another. Double click on the node and it will take you here and you can see what this is going to call. We're trying to keep the code as clean, readable and reusable as possible. So that's going to do the same thing. We know that there's still one bug to fix here and I'll be honest, I'm not too sure why. What we have happening is the bat is still kind of flying backwards at some point. So it happened there. So I'm wondering if we throw in a print string here, making sure that we're only doing this once. It may still be somehow falling through this. Maybe this point one isn't quite long enough and it could be that we're toggling this multiple times, uh, but maybe not toggling the direction or something. I'm not sure what's happening. So we'll print this, see what's happening. Uh, so we're only just seeing one hello return there. It seemed to be happening a lot more on this corner. We're only getting one there as well. Okay, so that isn't happening, which means I would do once is working correctly. So that is one good thing at least. And I'm going to keep this bit in as a kind of debugging tutorial. This wasn't intended, but sometimes, I mean, this is the way that programming goes. Development is usually not too straightforward. So this could be quite useful, hopefully, as a learning example. So the only other thing we're doing, we are flipping our Boolean check here. We're doing that once. We have our delay, which we know is working. So it means that it's going to have to be something to do with the logic in our toggle facing direction. So we'll just double click into here and we'll have a look at what's going on. So if we're coming in, we are taking the current direction and I can already see the problem. Okay. So because we have this kind of oddity that I mentioned earlier, at least I think that's what this will be. Because we have the enemy potentially facing the opposite direction from when we move, as soon as we begin play, we are potentially flipping this. So that would also make sense why it only happens when we're moving in the rightward direction, because we've already applied a multiplication based on the current scale of the sprite. So because we're taking that into context and flipping it that way, what I think we're doing is we are multiplying a negative by a negative in some cases, which isn't changing the direction that we need to go. So if we throw in an absolute node here, so we still want to get the value, but we'll make sure that we're getting the absolute value returned. So that would mean that in the cases where that's happening, we should be getting a negative multiplied by a positive and then still flipping that in the correct direction. So yeah, there we go. We could see that was the problem direction before. And there we go again. So just double check a few more times. We'll let this hit all of the different walls. 
Okay, so the delay time there was maybe a little bit too low because we were able to quickly change, but I mean, that made it look as though it was interacting with the level quite organically in a way, where it flipped, but then flipped straight back around and carried on. So I think I'm going to keep that in. That smaller delay seemed to work quite well there. A little bit of a toggle. We could have possibly had it so that it's a little bit longer. But the main thing, that was the absolute value, just a problem there. So that wasn't an issue to begin with because we're only ever hitting one wall. But once we've flipped a few times, we want to make sure that we're taking into account the correct multiplication here for the uh, some of the cases where we may be taking this already moving right because we've had to flip this at the beginning because technically the sprite is facing the wrong way to be moving forward to begin with we just want to make sure that this is updated to account for that and with that that seems to be working so we'll just double check how this works when we hit the far wall and there we go we're left in a kind of infinite loop i think this is more of something for us to fix in the uh, the, the level design here or the placement of the bat I think that looks better, so 0.2 delay. I think it, at least making it go between at this point and this point looks better than having it flip and then go up and over. Ideally, what we're going to do anyway is we're not going to place it somewhere where it can get into that issue. I would place it directly in line with this, so now even if it hits that, we're going to go between these two walls. Um, and in fact, we could also we could keep one here and let's put one down here. So we've now got multiple enemies in the level. And again, this way you can see they're not really having that issue. They're all going to be hitting things pretty much face on. So that I think is going to be a pretty good fix. With that done, we're pretty much ready to jump into the combat situations between the player and the enemy, the causing and taking damage between the two different classes. The only thing that sticks out is we've already done our overrides for the enemy class. So we have our enemy died functionality in the bat class from the base class. We just want to double check that the enemy bat has health as well, so again, we've set this to 100 default in the base class. If you wanted to change that here, you could change that to be overridden in each custom class, each custom child class, by overriding the default health. And remember, we, we leave the health alone, as that will be getting set in the construction script through the call to the parent class before we actually enter play. So if you wanted the bat to have very low health or something, then you could change that here. But with that done, I think we're ready to go now and start looking at how we can get the player and the enemy to interact with each other. So if you've been enjoying this topic, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. And of course, hit the notification bell so that you'll get the updates as soon as the next topic in this playlist goes live. And remember, if you wanted access to the full mini course all in one go, you can get that through the Skillshare link down below or through the gold tier Patreon or above rewards. Just wanted to give a big thank you to all of the people already supporting me over on Patreon. It is of course your support that allows me to make the more in-depth topics like this mini course for the channel. As ever, thanks for watching and I will see you all next time.